Baku, August 1945. After four years of devastating war, the first demobilized Red Army soldiers finally come home. But their happiness is bittersweet. Many of their comrades died on the battlefield. They will never experience the joy of seeing familiar smiling faces, or holding their loved ones in their arms, or coming back to a cozy home and a town spared by the fighting. However, their town came very close to being reduced to ashes and rubble. Since the onset of the war in the West, the various adversaries have taken turns at threatening Baku with total destruction. Nazi Germany, of course, but also England, France, and even Big Brother Moscow. To all involved at one point or another, Baku has been targeted for destruction because of its great wealth. Oil. August of 1939, although dark clouds are gathering in the west, Baku's skies are clear. Stalin has just signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler, and the capital of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan can pursue its peaceful existence, nestled between the barrier of the Caucasus Mountains and the shores of the Caspian Sea. Baku is also one of the Soviet Union's great administrative, industrial, scientific, and cultural cities. Poets have pride of place within its walls, with its opera house, its theaters, its cinemas, and its lust for life. Baku has earned since the beginning of the century the nickname Paris of the Caucasus. This Paris is located 4,000 kilometers from the original on land soaked in the black blood of the earth that has upended the century's economy and geopolitics. For as long as anyone can remember, the naphtha has always been visible, rising over the Absheron Peninsula. This ancient oil from stone, mined at shallow depths, will quickly be used in many ways. Fuel, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, dermatological products. But industrial exploitation doesn't truly begin until 1847, with the invention in Azerbaijan of the world's first mechanized drills. Fifty years later, the Nobels and the Rothschilds, two of Europe's most powerful families, own the lion's share of the oil fields among the new Azerbaijani oil barons. At the time, Baku was the world's number one oil-producing region, extracting 11 million tons annually, or half of the world's global production. Thousands of workers and adventurers flocked to Baku, attracted by the promise of black gold. During these gold rush years, the city also becomes a breeding ground for the first Bolsheviks. One particular rookie revolutionary from Georgia with gangster-like methods has come here to cut his teeth. He replenishes the party's coffers with funds stolen from banks and cash transporters. He distributes throughout the Tsar's empire Lenin's newspaper Iskra. Along with other Bolshevik titles, printed on a clandestine press named Nina, set up in a concealed cellar in Baku. He occasionally spends time in Bailov prison. To cover his tracks, he uses various aliases like Soso and Koba, 
the ones that crop up most often in police reports. By 1939, he no longer needs to hide. He has, for a long time, gone officially by the name of Stalin, and he is now at the helm of the USSR. He lives in Moscow, but he keeps a close eye on the city of his early activities. Even though Baku now produces eight times less oil than the USA, the new world leader, it still produces 22.5 million tons per year and 72% of the Soviet Union's entire production. The city is of crucial importance to the economy of the empire. It is the beating heart that sends the precious liquid into the great body of the sister republics and beyond through many different arteries. A network of pipelines, railways, and tankers, organized in the 1920s, send it throughout the empire and export it to the Western nations. Thanks to this vast network, Baku's oil contributes significantly to the USSR's economic development. Stalin is fiercely protective of this precious resource, highly coveted by his great European ideological rival, Adolf Hitler. This rival's ambition is to conquer the world. For several years now, he has been training his armies using mock-ups before sending them into the field. His goal, to annex neighboring lands that he deems vital to his country with the intention of establishing a thousand-year Reich. To achieve his goals, Hitler has created the Wehrmacht, a highly mechanized army. But its machines, which will become more and more efficient over the years, are very fuel-hungry. Depending on the model, a tank can burn up to 1,080 liters per 100 kilometers, and a plane can consume up to 2,150 liters per hour. To go to war, taking civilian consumption into account, Hitler must find, according to his experts, at least 9 million tons of fuel for the year 1939 alone. But the Greater Reich's oil wells production, including Austria and Moravia, which he just annexed, doesn't even cover one-tenth of his needs. Hence, soon after Hitler came to power in 1933, he encouraged chemical giant IG Farben to work on producing synthetic oil from the coal that Germany has in abundance. It is a more costly process than natural extraction, but for Hitler, it is the price of independence. Still, only one-third of Germany's requirements are met. For the rest, trade agreements with Romania will provide him with nearly 1.7 million tons of petroleum products. And the credit agreement just signed with the Soviet Union, four days before the non-aggression pact, guarantees him the delivery of 160,000 tons with the opportunity of additional shares, which he intends to increase to two million tons a year. This fuel will be delivered to the Polish border, where it must be transferred because of the change in the track gauge. But even once this is all added up, it's still not enough to build reserves. Hitler needs other sources. It is September 1st, 1939 just eight days after the agreement with Stalin was signed. Without a prior declaration of war, Hitler launches into Poland a staggering mass of mechanized equipment, including 1,600 fighter planes and bombardiers and 2,600 panzers. He has just introduced a new kind of warfare, the Blitzkrieg, which reduces fuel consumption thanks to its swiftness. His primary goal is to take back the Danzig Corridor, which Germany lost in the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. He also plans to take control of the oil wells in Galicia, to the southeast of Poland. But he will be forced to share it with his ally Stalin. After just six weeks of fighting, his fuel reserves are deeply sapped. France and England, the two great European democracies in the West, declare war on Nazi Germany, bound by their commitments to Poland. But they aren't prepared for armed conflict and helplessly watch Germany's swift progress. In just one month, German forces dominate the Polish army, 
forced to surrender despite its solid reputation. What is the best course for confronting this steamroller? How can it be neutralized? One sure way to paralyze the Wehrmacht is to close the Baku faucet. This will stop Soviet oil from filling the fuel tanks of Germany's panzers, planes, and ships. During the early months of the phony war, the Allied Chiefs of Staff devise various campaign plans. Whether the code name is Pike, RIP, or MA6, the goal is always the same, bombing Baku. They allocate important funds for building airfields and training of pilots. In the end, they choose an attack route from northern Iraq. Two high-altitude reconnaissance flights are conducted over Baku and Batumi. The bombings, spread out over a period of 45 days, are scheduled to begin on May 15, 1940. The date is subsequently pushed back to June 30th. Group Captain John Slesser, in charge of operations, has 160 long-range bomber planes at his disposal, half British and half French. More than 900 tons of ammunition are earmarked for this operation, including 5,250-pound bombs and 70,000 four-pound incendiary bombs, which will turn the entire oil-seeped region into a massive inferno. Baku will be wiped off the map, no matter what will happen to its population. The people of Baku follow these events from afar. They don't feel directly concerned by this war begun in the West. They believe themselves to be sheltered from danger thanks to the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. And life goes on as usual. They are completely unaware of the terrible threat hanging over them, which could shake up their lives forever. Fortunately for them, unexpected events in the West come to their rescue. On the dawn of May 10, 1940, Hitler unleashes his armies on Holland, Belgium, and France. Once again, a formidable mechanized mass is launched into battle, crushing everything in its wake and marching ahead at full speed towards the Channel and Paris. strategists are convinced that this pace cannot be sustained and that fuel will soon run out. However, they forget to neutralize the main storage depots located in Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, as well as the distribution networks, so the Germans simply help themselves. Their spoils easily cover their own consumption. By the time the depots in the Paris region are set on fire, it's already too late. Defeat is inevitable. One by one, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France are brought to heel. On June 14th, the Nazi flag is flying over the Eiffel Tower. Great Britain, which has managed at the last minute to re-embark its troops, finds itself alone in the fight, in a holding position back home. In the skies over the English Channel, Hitler is ready for the Battle of Britain. Despite a numerical advantage of four to one, his 3,000 planes don't manage to make the difference, though they do eat significantly into his fuel reserves. Far from the war, Baku's residents are astonished to learn that they have just escaped a hellish fate. This piece of information comes from the Germans who, during the French campaign, got their hands on top secret documents detailing the Pike Plan. Nonetheless, the Soviet authorities in the Caucasus were already on guard. Aircraft artillery had been reinforced and the general staff of the regional military district went so far as to undertake a training exercise that simulates responding to an aerial attack.
Meanwhile, Baku's oil wells and refineries are running at full speed. In addition to supplying the country as usual, on top of the exports to Germany, the Central Committee and the Council of the People's Commissars have decided to constitute enormous inland fuel reserves of all kinds. Gasoline, airplane fuel, diesel, aviation oil, motor oil and lubricants in order to satisfy all military needs. 80% of this stock is fully dependent on Baku's oil production, as well as on the workers, technicians, chemists, and engineers. But with the Anglo-French menace barely avoided, they are unaware that new threats are looming on the horizon. In the spring of 1941, Hitler receives an alert from his supply services. The army will be short on oil by August. To hell with the treaties. He will help himself at the source. He spells it out clearly for his generals. Once the Red Army has been destroyed, the Wehrmacht will head for Baku's oil wells and seize them. Already on October 8, 1940, he had sent the Wehrmacht to invade Romania to protect its oil fields, which he believed to be within easy reach by the Soviets. And in November, Romania has enlisted at Germany's side, granting it a monopoly on Romanian oil, amounting to 3.5 million tons annually. Hitler is now ready to turn against Stalin. On June 22, 1941, breaking his promise, he launches Operation Barbarossa. 3,200 planes, 3,300 tanks, 600,000 motor vehicles, 625,000 horses, and 3 million men descend without warning upon the Soviet Union. Once again, Hitler is counting on the surprise factor and the massive number of troops to wage a lightning war with three initial targets, Leningrad in the north, Moscow in the center, and Kiev in the south. Once again, he will have to move quickly. His gasoline reserves will only last through three months of operations, and there is only enough aviation fuel to keep planes in the air for a month. From now on, he can no longer count on the Soviet deliveries. On his side, Stalin is shocked, despite the many warnings he has refused to believe up to the very end that his trade partner could possibly betray him. He even went so far as to shoot a German communist deserter who had come to warn him. He also ignored the words of caution spoken by Ramsey, his special agent in Japan, better known as Dr. Zorge. This man was a native of the Baku region, who even gave him the exact date of the invasion. Once Stalin regains his composure, he calls upon the patriotism of all Soviet peoples and of the Red Army, which marched so proudly through Red Square just a month and a half ago. He's able to pull together 4.5 million men, more than 20,000 tanks, and 15,000 planes to fight the invader. Stalin declares to President Roosevelt's personal envoy, the fate of the war depends on gasoline motors. He, for one, has no fuel supply issues, he can count on Caucasian oil. In Baku, astonishment quickly gives way to commotion. The country is at war. Everyone must be mobilized to face it. 700,000 people, nearly a quarter of the overall population of Azerbaijan, will eventually sign up throughout the conflict to fight their great patriotic war. After training, the 193rd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Regiment stationed in Baku is redeployed to the west of Moscow to defend the besieged capital city. Women everywhere volunteer to replace the men who have left for the front.
In the oil industry, they decide, along with their male counterparts, to extend their work shifts, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year, without any breaks or holidays, until the end of the conflict. In the summer of 1942, there are over 25,000 women workers, one third of the oil labor force. Their shifts can last up to 18 hours, in the refineries and chemical factories, the number is even greater. Women will even account for 60% of the workforce in 1944. As a result, during the first year of the war from June 1941 to June 1942, Baku's oil production will jump to 23.5 million tons in all-time record. Anyone who is too young to fight, all the veterans and retired oil workers Everyone is put to contribution, irrespective of age or gender. The Soviet Union needs every able arm in hand. The mothers need to be free to work, so the state takes care of the children. But it can't stop the ghost of war from flying over the nurseries. We have only to kick in the door, and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down, Hitler predicted. The first weeks of the conflict seem to prove him right. The Soviet lines have been demolished, swept away. In just one month, the Germans are only 150 kilometers from Leningrad, 300 kilometers from Moscow, and 200 kilometers from Kiev. They seized the fuel reserves distributed along the border three weeks earlier by the Soviet government for its own vehicles. Unfortunately for the Germans, most of the 100,000 tons seized turns out to be diesel, and it's useless to them. Their panzers and trucks run on gasoline. So they set the reserves on fire and charge onwards. The British don't think that the Soviets can last more than six months. Through their occupation of Syria to the south of Azerbaijan, the British now control, along with the Americans, a major part of the Middle East and its rich oil reserves. They still intend to deprive Hitler of Caucasian oil. The Royal Air Force Chief of Staff tells his military commanders on location to stand by to bomb Baku. The city converts to a wartime economy. The factories working for the oil industry begin to manufacture flamethrowers, machine guns, Katyusha rocket launchers, nicknamed Stalin's organs, parts for mortars, and assault rifles. They also produce ammunitions of all types and sizes, shells, anti-tank landmines, incendiary bombs, grenades, and even Molotov cocktails at a rate of up to 10,000 units per day. Huge warehouses are built to assemble the planes that are delivered in separate parts. Shipyards are reopened to provide maintenance and repairs on the Caspian Sea cargo ships and tankers. Thanks to a new process invented by the prominent Azerbaijani chemist Yusuf Mamadaliev, the oil refineries are now able to produce a high-octane airplane fuel that greatly improves the performance of the Soviet Air Force and allows its pilots to compete head-on with the Luftwaffe aces. In Ukraine, despite a damaged and untarred road network which clogs the engines, the German armored division makes a speedy progress causing additional fuel consumption. The stretching of the lines on 500 to 750 kilometers creates difficulties in terms of supplying both machines and men. But nothing seems to stop them. By the end of September 1941, Leningrad is surrounded. The Germans are a mere 100 kilometers from Moscow, and they occupy a large part of the Ukraine. 
After three months of campaign, Hitler can boast about making 2.5 million prisoners and destroying or capturing 22,000 cannons, 18,000 tanks, and 14,500 planes. He has no doubt he will soon seize the capital of the Soviet Empire. And he will finally get his hands on its riches. Just 1,000 kilometers left to reach Baku. Then come the torrential autumn rains. In just days, the roads turn into a muddy quagmire that immobilizes all vehicles. Even the tanks have trouble getting through because their tracks are too narrow. The Rasputitsa, the muddy period, slows the Wehrmacht down, ultimately paralyzing it. Once the roads have turned to ice, the panzers are able to resume their inexorable progress. They are only 30 kilometers from the capital when, on December 5th, a Soviet counterattack led by General Zhukov succeeds in loosening their stranglehold. The Germans are pushed back, sometimes up to 200 kilometers away from Moscow, thanks to a renewed Soviet Air Force and just as an early winter descends upon them. Temperatures quickly drop to minus 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. Exceptional weather conditions that freeze men and equipment, vehicles and weapons. The soldiers do everything they can to keep warm. Once again, the front is immobilized, this time for many long months. The Soviets can rejoice. The Blitzkrieg has failed. As long as the Volga remains navigable, the Baku tankers continue to supply Moscow with all kinds of fuel, particularly for the planes, and cover 80% of the Red Army's requirements. In Baku, the first onslaught of winter produces far less human casualties than German attacks. This winter will leave the children with lasting memories of magical delight and a moment of warmth and comfort shared with those fighting the Nazi invader somewhere on the front. In February 1942, a drilling brigade receives the Order of the Red Banner in recognition for its exceptional contribution to the defense of the Soviet motherland. And by decree of the Supreme Soviet, Baku's 500 best oil workers are honored at the House of Technology. Their commitment is unwavering. During the month of April alone, they ship over 500,000 tons of petroleum products over the Caspian Sea. And they produce an additional 800,000 tons in the following months in order to replenish the country's fuel reserves, which have shrunk by half since the outbreak of the hostilities. At his headquarters in Vinitsa, Ukraine, Hitler revives the plan he had presented a year earlier to his general staff, christened Case Blue. The objective to take control of the Caucasian oil fields will have a double impact. It will bring Stalin to his knees by depriving him of fuel deliveries and solve Hitler's own supply issues. He even sets the capture of Baku on September 25th, a prediction that no one in his entourage is allowed to doubt about. An entire department, the Stab Westfalen, is set up to organize the restoration and the exploitation of the oil wells. A propaganda film even shows that Hitler has jumped the gun and is already cutting himself a large slice of the proverbial Soviet pie. First, the events seem to prove him right. In only two months, the Southern armies capture Sevastopol and complete the occupation of the Ukraine. The Red Army, apparently in a state of total chaos, 
is brutally and violently pushed back everywhere. But his chief of staff warns him, at this rate, the oil reserves will be gone by mid-September. Hitler decides to accelerate his plan and split up his troops. General Paulus receives the order to block all traffic on the Volga to the north of Stalingrad, while General List is to capture the Kuban and seize the Caucasian oil hubs. If we don't take Makeup and Grozny, I'll have no choice but to end the war, Hitler reminds them. Rostov falls on July 25th, and the Germans cross the Don with a front line stretching over 300 kilometers. They cut off the pipeline and the railway lines that supply the Red Army, and forge ahead at incredible speed. Hitler is jubilant. The Russian is finished, he says. But once again, supplies can't keep up with the speed of operations. At the end of July, the vehicles are stalled for lack of fuel. General Paulus has to suffer through an eight-day wait 300 kilometers from Stalingrad until he can refuel and set off on the road to conquest again. The German threat forces Stalin to react. He has order number 227 read to all units, not one step back. He summons Nikolai Babakov, the brand new deputy people's commissar to the oil industry. Babakov is a native of Baku with a diploma from Azerbaijan's Petrochemical Institute. Stalin gives him his orders. Hitler is telling everyone that if he doesn't get his hands on Caucasian oil, he'll lose the war, he says. You're flying immediately to Caucasia to help him lose this war. But no one can resist the pressure of the German army, which resumes as soon as the panzers are refueled. The cities of the Kuban fall one after the other. On August 9th, General von Kleist invades Maikop, only to discover that the oil fields are actually 50 kilometers farther south. Regardless, Radio Berlin rushes to announce that Maikop's oil 19,000 tons produced daily will now supply the Reich. But when he reaches the heart of the petroleum basin a week later, von Kleist discovers that almost all the wells were sabotaged. Only two remain operational. However, after the oil brigade restores the wells, they still won't manage to produce even 10 tons a day. The disappointment is the same in Krasnodar, the Cossack capital, which is the most important industrial city of the Kuban region and a major hub of oil refining activity. Here as well, the majority of oil products and equipment have been evacuated to Grozny and the remainder has been destroyed. Refinery number five and its 80,000 tons of refined oil have been torched. The pipeline has been sabotaged and the wells have been sealed with reinforced concrete. Despite this setback, the Germans continue east towards Grozny and south towards the Black Sea. They travel through the Caucasian mountain passes, manually hauling heavy artillery at altitudes of up to 3,000 meters. On August 21st, the Groth Group of the 1st Mountain Division plants the swastika flag at the top of Mount Elbrus. At 5,642 meters, this is the highest peak in the Caucasus and Europe. In Azerbaijan, this symbolic conquest is disturbing. The German threat is becoming clearer. In Baku, authorities prepare the population for invasion. From the neighboring countryside, 
farmers volunteer their generous contributions to the war effort and to participate in constituting a tank column. The Anglo-American allies provide these tanks through the land-lease policy Stalin negotiated with Roosevelt's representative. They arrive directly in Baku from Iran, ever since the German submarines have been preventing the Allied convoys from traveling over the Baltic Sea. Until the end of the conflict, important military equipment will transit through the port of Baku, including almost 5,000 tanks, some of which are allocated to defending the Caucasus. Stalingrad is also preparing for a German offensive. General Paulus's 6th Army is only 50 kilometers away. On August 23rd, the city sees Air Fleet 4, led by von Richthofen, who bombed Guernica, appear in its skies. 600 planes have begun making their deathly rounds, sparing almost nothing and no one. The nine massive oil reservoirs are a prime target for German pilots. Millions of tons of fuel go up in smoke, a filthy, black, acrid smoke that will float in the air for days. The fuel seeping from the gutted tankers burns on the Volga. Not even the town's beautiful buildings along the water are spared, nor are the older houses. 40,000 people lose their lives during this initial bomb attack. The battle will last 162 days. 162 days of relentless urban guerrilla warfare, during which the Germans will conquer up to 90% of the city, meter by meter, house by house. The Luftwaffe drops mines over the Volga, hammering away at the ships traveling up the river. It will soon control traffic all the way to Astrakhan, but will not succeed in fully blocking it. Braving the air attacks, the Casp Flot and Casp Tanker sailors based in Baku incessantly continue delivering food, fuel, and war material throughout the siege of Stalingrad. In total, 149,000 tons of fuel are delivered to the Red Army units defending the city, albeit at great human and material cost. When the sailors of Baku run out of ships, they inaugurate a new means of transportation. For the first time in the world, all sorts of cisterns, sometimes entire trains of them, are seen afloat on the water, towed by a steamboat. The Red Army must be supplied at all costs. But in the north of the Caucasus, the Germans are increasingly persistent. The panzers have reached the Terek and threaten Malgobek and Orjan Nikijay. They are a mere 60 kilometers from Grozny and 500 kilometers from Baku, within reach of the German Air Force, which has taken over the Stavropol Air Base. But after three months of combat, the German troops are exhausted. They are closer to Baku, but they are also 750 kilometers from their supply bases, and even the oil tankers are running out of gasoline. The logistics services resort to local and more traditional means of transportation. Less fuel hungry, but much more temperamental. On September 6th, 1942, Radio Moscow broadcasts Stalin's last chance appeal to the Transcaucasia republics. We shall resist until death. This is our country's warning call. 
Martial law is declared immediately. Volunteers join the anti-tank detachments and the special battalions that are defending the trails leading to the Black Sea. Stalin's message has also reached Azerbaijan. The State Defense Committee mobilizes 90,000 local residents, mostly women, to strengthen military defenses around the cities. Baku prepares to staunchly defend its oil rigs. To avoid them falling into enemy hands, the most modern ones are disassembled and sent to the new oil basins in the Northeast, along with the best engineers and technicians. This massive undertaking is designed to promote the new El Dorado, sheltered from danger. 764 wells are sealed with concrete, and 81 complete drilling units are moved to Kuibyshev, Currente Samara, 2,000 kilometers away. This is a risky move, given that the region is currently producing only 2 million tons annually, 10% of Baku's oil production. Because of the number of relocated Baku workers, almost 6,000, the region is nicknamed Second Baku. But the area's climate bears little resemblance to the mildness of the Caspian shores. If it is hot in summer, in winter the temperatures drop regularly to 30 or 35 degrees below zero. But despite these harsh conditions, the personnel manages to increase extraction by 42% in the first year. Five new oil and gas deposits are discovered. They also begin construction on an enormous refinery and on the first pipeline designed to supply the armament factories 165 kilometers further east. In Baku, in order to compensate for lost production due to the closing of the modern wells, 25 old and abandoned wells are now reactivated at the environment's expense. Production is crucial, whatever the cost. This is a daily combat, and all the workers are mobilized at their stations. They cannot be drafted into the Red Army without special permission from the State Defense Committee. A slogan even says, our Stalingrad is in every well. At the initiative of Nikolai Bybakov, who has been appointed to the State Defense Committee, trains carrying explosives are routed discreetly to Baku. They are meant to destroy the remaining wells, but only as a last resort. Bybakov is on a tightrope. Stalin warns him, if you leave even one ton of oil to the Germans, we will shoot you. After a short pause, he adds, if you destroy the oil fields, but Hitler fails to reach them, and we are left without fuel, we will shoot you again. Baku is now living under a double threat. The enemy wants to occupy the city at all costs. But even worse, her own side is ready to sacrifice her. Not to mention that Churchill hasn't yet given up on joining the party. A map of Baku, complete with bombing targets, was found in the National Library in Edinburgh. In North Caucasia, air refueling makes it possible for the Panzers to set off again. But they are now confronted by stronger resistance on behalf of the Soviets, who bomb Stavropol. Fire! The invaders' morale plummets as the defenders' one rises. The Soviets now try to take the Germans from the back. To avoid being trapped, the Germans will soon have to retreat. Hitler realizes he will not succeed in capturing Baku, and that this year's race for oil is over. If he can't have the Caucasian wells, his enemy should be deprived of them too. On his orders, Richthofen and his remaining 123 working bomber planes launch a series of raids on Grozny, bombing it heavily between the 10th and the 12th of October. However, the refineries have been disassembled and evacuated, along with the oil reserves, towards the Caspian. Although Hitler would like to subject Baku to a similar fate, the city is now out of the German Air Force's range, ever since the Soviet Air Force destroyed the Stavropol base. 
Hitler now shifts all his attention to Stalingrad. If he wants to save face and to keep a door open to Caucasia in order to relaunch his Baku offensive during the next campaign, he absolutely must capture the city named after his enemy. How symbolic. Paulus's 6th Army now controls 90% of the city. However, on November 19, 1942, for the first time in this battle, the Red Army regains the upper hand. Zhukov counterattacks by sending his generals, Batutin from the north and Yeryamenko from the south, to surround Paulus's forces. In just days, both Soviet armies join up. Paulus is encircled between the Don and the Volga, unable to move. On November 23rd, he sends word to Hitler. Top secret, mein Führer. We are almost out of fuel. In fact, he has only enough fuel to move his hundred remaining tanks 30 kilometers. But the closest German lines are 50 kilometers away. Hitler asks Richthofen to organize an airlift. For 70 days, despite the risks, 95 tons of materials, ammunitions, food, and fuel are delivered each day. But this is far from sufficient for an army of 270,000 men who need seven times more. On the way back, the Luftwaffe is able to evacuate 25,000 injured troops. On the Soviet side, the wounded are regularly evacuated by way of the Volga. Most of the time, they are sent to Baku. Over the summer, hospitals set up for the duration of the conflict have begun to take them in. In total, within four years of war, nearly half a million wounded soldiers are treated in Baku. These men briefly escape from the hell of war before they must return to combat. Paulus, trapped in Stalingrad by the snow and the cold, now faces Zhukov's counteroffensive. The airlift, which has proven ineffective, has been interrupted. Both the men and the machines are starving. This ordeal lasts for over a month. The Soviets, on the other hand, don't face any shortage of food, fuel, or ammunitions. Polis' situation is hopeless. On January 31st, 1943, he surrenders with part of his 24 generals and of the remaining 110,000 survivors of his army, followed two days later by the last fighters. Hitler has just promoted him to field marshal, perhaps in the hope that he will commit suicide. Never before has a German field marshal been captured alive, but Paulus prefers to surrender. The Germans will never have the opportunity to move on Caucasia again. Never again will they be a threat to Baku, which, despite a drop by half in its oil production due to the relocations, will keep sending to the Red Army thousands of kilometers of rail cars of oil. 1,300 kilometers just for the biggest tank battle in history in Kursk in July, August, 1943. Baku, now safe from harm, receives some famous travelers. In November 1943, Stalin passes through on his way to the Tehran Conference with the Allies. Rumor has it that before leaving, he will insist on visiting the Bailov jail, surely reminiscent of his turbulent youth. And de Gaulle in November 1944, on the way to Moscow to meet Stalin. During a 24-hour layover, he is invited by local officials to discover the treasures of the Azerbaijani opera.
Six months later, on May 9, 1945, the entire city celebrates the announcement of Germany's surrender. For its population, Baku would have deserved the cannon salute that Stalin granted to his four hero cities, Leningrad, Stalingrad, Sebastopol, and Odessa eight days earlier. Even if Baku has avoided these martyr cities' fate, it has considerably contributed to the victory by offering to the common cause its oil and the lives of its people. Every family grieves the loss of a father, a husband, a brother, or a son. Of the 700,000 Azerbaijani who enlisted, 400,000 never returned home. But everyone, soldiers of the front line and behind the lines, can take comfort in the fact that without the black blood of their earth, the Soviet Union and its allies of convenience in the West might not have won the war. At that moment in time, they can imagine a more confident future. But could they ever imagine in their wildest dreams that 50 years later their country will regain its independence? Cherished for a moment during the first Azerbaijani Republic from 1918 to 1920? And that their country will finally be free to manage its precious resources on its own?